Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. We are now going to look at markup and what it means and how it is used in order to control how something gets displayed on a screen. Now this is a very primary or a main uh, part of what is called the user interface, the part that faces the user and how we interact with the computer in the first place, right? So markup is something that is used in order to change the way something is shown to the user and ultimately deals with the aesthetics or the sense of beauty or the sense of how nice something looks. And obviously, as you would all be familiar by now, the better that a site looks, there are some sort of indefinable ways in which you can clearly say that one site looks better than another, right? In some cases, it is obvious. In other cases, it is less obvious. But there is a concept of aesthetics that finally determines how we interact with a website. So markup plays a very important role in that because ultimately that is how the developer, the person who is developing the website can make changes to the website in such a way that the way that it gets displayed to the user changes. So let's try and understand what it is. So we are going to look at a few things. First of all, how do we represent information inside a computer? There is also a distinction between the so-called raw data versus the semantics. What does it mean? We will also try and understand the distinction between logical structure of a document versus the styling, how it is presented to you. And finally, we will look at HTML5 and CSS, but only at a very high level, primarily because those are the technologies that we will be using as part of this course, because as far as the web is concerned, those are the primary underlying presentation technologies, the parts that determine how a page looks. Okay, so first things first, what do we mean by information representation? Okay, As you are all familiar, computers work only with bits because ultimately they are digital logic systems, which means that you are essentially everything inside the computer, any not just computation but even information is stored in the form of bits, either a 0 or a 1. This works out nicely because from the electrical standpoint, you have either a 0 volts, which is essentially the ground level, or a 1, which is some kind of a high voltage level. High could possibly some, be something like 1 volt even, right? So it's not really a high voltage, it's just something which is clearly distinguishable from the 0. Why do we do this? Because it turns out that not only can you sort of build up a nice algebra and way of manipulating all the uh, bits so that more involved computations can be performed, they are also very robust to noise. In other words, if there is any disturbance or uncertainty or temperature fluctuations, none of those are going to affect the system, at least not easily. Right? So computers and pretty much any digital logic that we have today work with bits. Those are essentially, a bit is a binary digit, means that it can take on only two values, 0 or 1. Okay? So unlike the alphabet, for example, where I can write A, B, C, D up to Z, 26 letters, right? or the Indian alphabets, most of which have somewhere in the region of 50 characters or so, 50 alphabets, right? We have here only two, 0 and 1, okay? Which means that everything inside the computer has to be represented using these bits. What that in turn means is, I can't just look at a 0 or a 1 somewhere arbitrarily and decide what it means. I need to follow certain conventions. I need to say if a 0 or a 1 appears in this particular location or in this particular place or in, in this particular context, I will interpret it in a certain manner. Right? So we know already that if I have decided that a certain set of bits represents a number, then I can interpret that number. For example, we know that we can represent binary numbers. For example, the sequence 0, 1, 1, 0 would represent the number 6. This is based on the place value system, right? So it's 0 into 2 to the power of 0 plus 1 into 2 to the power of 1 plus 1 into 2 to the power of 2 plus 0 into 2 to the power of 3, which finally gives us 6. Now what about negative numbers? Remember we have only 0 and 1, so we can't even afford a minus sign, which is why the 2's complement representation comes into the picture. Again, it's a question of interpretation. If I see this sequence 1, 0, 1, 0, right? I know that if the number that I am talking about is a 4-bit 2's complement number, then this value, the value corresponding to 1010 is minus 6. 
Instead, if you told me that it was a 4 bit unsigned number, it would actually have the value plus 10. Or if I told you I do not know what this is, then the best that you can say is this is a sequence 1010. You do not really know what it means, right. But then comes the question what about, okay, so numbers so far so good, right. We have a handle on how we might be able to represent numbers. The concept of, you know, context and how we interpret these numbers is still important, but at least the coding itself is easy. But what about letters, right? There is no natural coding which says that a particular number or a particular sequence of bits should correspond to A or another sequence should correspond to B, right? So that basically takes us to the question of how do we represent text, right? And we will take text to be a sort of the most important thing that we need to represent because any other thing can be similarly encoded. It is only a question of that we understand in what context we are trying to represent the sequences that we have, right. So there are a few different concepts that we need to sort of keep in mind over here and I will be going over those uh, in the coming slides. So representing text, the core idea right, that people recognized a long time ago pretty much as soon as digital computers came into existence. Right. Why am I saying digital computers? Because there were analog computers before that, right? I mean, there were things which basically did some kind of differential equation solving and so on, which in some sense were analog computers. So, a computer is anything that can compute. A digital computer is something that works with digital logic. Now, what that means is you need to be able to exchange information between such systems, such computers. And this information interchange could either be between machines directly right, one machine talking to another, let us say a computer talking to a printer or between humans and machines. I mean between, directly between humans we are unlikely to have to, you know, represent letters as bits. But when a machine is trying to display something to a human or a human is trying to communicate something to a machine, you need to be able to talk in a common language and the machine is the one that no, is less flexible. It requires a language to be something that it can understand. Machines only work with bits, right? 0 and 1 are the only alphabets, so to speak, available to you, which means that we need to decide on some kind of a standard encoding, right? And say that this sequence of bits represents a certain character. So, this brings us to the question, supposing I just put down the sequence of bits in front of you, right? 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, okay? It is a perfectly valid binary sequence and the question we are asking is, what does that binary sequence represent? First, is it a string of bits? Of course, it is a string of bits, that is undeniable, right? It is zeros and ones, so there is no problem with that. It can always be interpreted as a string of bits that is not very helpful. But if I take this, you know, the so called binary system with the place values and so on and say, okay, I am going to interpret this as the number 65 decimal. Yes, that is another perfectly valid interpretation of this sequence of bits, okay. But then I come along and say, okay, I am instead going to interpret this as the character capital A, okay. It is a single letter capital A. Which of these is correct? Of course, all of the above, right? And what it means is that it is basically a matter of how we interpret the data and more importantly, context, right? If I just saw the sequence 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 as a set of random bits scribbled on a wall, I do not know what to make of it. But if I see it in, let us say, a maths book or in something which is discussing binary arithmetic, I am almost certainly going to interpret it as the number 65. Whereas if I see it somewhere else which is talking about character encodings or how we can represent letters using bits, then it makes sense that it is probably the code for A, okay. So the context in which we see this makes a big difference to how we interpret bits. In the same way, inside a computer, there is a large memory layout, right. There is a lot of place where bits are stored. The program itself is not randomly going around, you know, picking up arbitrary locations in memory and deciding what to do with them. It goes through them in sequence, which means that as far as the program 
the execution of the program is concerned, certain memory locations have specific meanings. So you might have declared a variable as a string constant and it the internal program right after compilation would have said that the pointer to this memory location is such and such. Which means that if I go to that memory location, I have context which tells me that these string of bits should be interpreted as characters. Okay. So with all of that in mind, the US which was sort of the leader as far as the digital technology in the 60s and 70s at least was concerned, they proposed this thing called the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, right? Information interchange, right? It's basically for how we can transfer information between devices or between humans and machines. And that is what we now know as ASCII, right? You might have heard the term ASCII codes. This is precisely what ASCII is. So it's a standardized code which basically describes how specific strings of bits should be interpreted. And the original ASCII was a 7 bit code, right? Why 7 bits? Because it was a time before even you know 8 bit computers were standardized. The number of bits was something precious. You didn't really want to use up more bits than necessary. So people actually tried to optimize the number of bits and the fact that you could use 7 bits for something probably made more sense than unnecessarily using 8 bits, right? So it is a 7 bit code. Among other things, it had encodings for all the small letters A to Z and the capital letters A to Z, right? Note that these are actually treated differently. ASCII of course did a nice thing in the sense that the codes for, I mean, between capital A and small a differ only in a single bit, right? But that's just for our convenience. As far as a computer is concerned, it probably doesn't make too much difference. They are independent codes anyway. And a computer doesn't really understand the letter A, right? It just sees a code and needs to know what to do with it. Apart from these, of course, you also need the numbers 0 to 9, several special characters, right? Exclamation marks, the at symbol, which we are very familiar with now, but which was not really used all that much then. But you know, things like dollar signs, percentage signs, ampersands, those were very common, of course. Meaning that there are special characters. So, what do we have? We have 26 alphabets. 26 uppercase alphabets, that's 52, another 10 digits, 62, a number of special characters probably takes you into the 70s or so, right? Something for a space, something for a full stop, something for a comma, and a number of escape characters, right? I mean, so something like just extra characters, which are sort of special characters that may not really have a specific meaning outside of a digital computer, like enter or return or you know the carriage return line feed those kind of characters end result was you know somewhere in the region of more than 60 but less than 100 characters that you need to represent what's the minimum number of bits you need seven right with seven bits you can represent up to 128 entities with six bits you would have managed only 64 it would have been a tight squeeze i mean basically not possible if you also wanted special characters so seven bits but the question naturally arose after some time. I mean, you know, for a long time, ASCII was pretty much a good standard. Of course, after some time, the Europeans got fed up because European languages have a lot of special characters of their own, right? They have like the accents on top of E and A and various other things. And they needed encodings which could represent those, which meant that pretty much something like an extended ASCII format came into the picture, which added one more bit. It became an 8-bit code. You can now go up to 256 characters. That was enough for pretty much all scripts that are derived from the Latin alphabet, right? The Roman alphabet or Latin alphabet, the ABCD that we are familiar with. But there are a lot of other languages, right? So, for example, within India itself, you have Hindi, you have Tamil, you have Malayalam. Outside India, you have Thai, you have Chinese, Japanese, various other languages, right? You start adding all of these together and you find very quickly that 256 is just not going to cut it. You need thousands of characters to be represented. So eventually, after a lot of, I mean, the whole point over here is that you need to have a standard representation, right? I mean, everybody can't come and develop their own representations because it means that you can't communicate with each other after a while. So the Unicode was sort of created as a consortium. Many different companies, universities, various interested parties came together 
and created a standard which allows codes for many more scripts and basically for different characters for letters you still have the question how many should we have right should you support all living languages all living as well as past possibly extinct languages right what about hieroglyphics right what about the sumerian cuneiform script right should you have cune the actual unicode letters corresponding to each one of those even though we haven't even interpreted those languages completely right what about future languages maybe some new script comes along right which is found to be more efficient or somehow different right or we meet aliens at some point doesn't matter the point is at how do you stop right so at least the idea behind unicode was to come up with some kind of a universal character set encoding the original ucs was sort of a two, two byte encoding right two bytes per character and at that point they pretty much had this restriction that two bytes means a maximum of two to the power of 16 or 65,536 different permutations, right? Different combinations of those bits. Now, in fact, in the original Unicode, while it was being defined, they pretty much explicitly said that the idea here was if you have past languages or things which are not really commonly used, they will not be encoded in Unicode. Think of some other ways of encoding them, right? A valid way of looking at it, part of the reason being that, you know, if you want to encode more, the first thing is you don't know how many might come and the second is you are going to use more bytes per character you already have two bytes per character over here which means that you have doubled the space required to store even a simple text document right let's say that you had a small document with like a hundred words in it normally that would be 100 into 5 around 500 bytes or so right whereas with ucs2 two bytes per character you now need one kilobyte exactly double okay but anyway at some point people said look there are enough languages that the 65000 can be a problem it makes it too tight right so let's look at ucs4 which is 4 bytes per character now you can go up to at least 4 billion characters okay is that enough well we never know right at least right now it looks like it might be enough but in future will we encounter a situation where we don't have enough encode encodings possibly now, at present, out of these 4 billion possibilities, somewhere around, I think, uh, more than 100,000 encoding spaces are defined. So, in other words, out of the possible 4 billion combinations of bits, of 32 bits, that is 4 bytes, about 100,000 or so actually have Unicode definitions. The rest are pretty much undefined. Okay, So, you can see that it is fairly sparse. Only a small number of them ha actually have definition. But it doesn't matter. The it was a conscious choice between the efficiency of the encoding and the capability of encoding more information. 